have to brace yourself. It's hard to think of any other TV series with as recognizable a tone as Black Mirror. When you slip into a Black Mirror episode, you instantly feel it. It's bleak, tech-saturated, infused with subtle foreboding, though with a down-to-earth, familiar, not hyperdramatic feel. It looks like our world, but something's off. Slanted. Answers are withheld from us. And as multiple twists and turns unfold in the story, we feel as if we receive the answer to the question or thought experiment that's being posed through the dramatic scenario. I know people. We love humiliation. As creator Charlie Brooker once put it, Black Mirror is a flavor. In his words, it's like a box of chocolates in terms of variety, but they're all dark chocolates. This identity is so distinctive that, in a way, the show itself faces the challenge of living up to its own past, of continuing to be Black Mirror enough. Each new episode is judged based on how well it captures that specific something that felt so original and particular about White Christmas, 15 Million Merits, the entire history of you, and so many others. So, How Black Mirror is season five. In our How to Spot the Twist video, we laid out a blueprint of common patterns in this series which can actually help you predict where an episode is going. So now we're going to use those rules to determine how well season five's three installments channel the show's special recipe. And in the end, we'll decide which episode is the most Black Mirror. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. It's a hand-picked selection of movie gems from around the world. So click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. One guideline we outlined in our twist video is watch for repetitions. If a Black Mirror episode keeps returning to a key detail, pay attention, because this just might unlock where the story is going. In season five's first episode, Striking Vipers, a central theme keeps resurfacing, role play. It's highlighted in the opening scene. You here by yourself? So far. Oh. Shame, pretty girl like you. As young couple Theo and Danny connect through pretending to be strangers. That little role play act, the stranger thing at the bar, it's got me hot as f After the episode flashes forward 11 years, the story transitions into portraying a different kind of role play that's a fixture in our society, numbly performing the part of the responsible adult. Simon's into bikes. Do you like motorcycles or just bikes? Just bikes. We get recurring hints that our now adult couple continues to be drawn to strangers. Like this shot of Danny looking out the window at a random woman, Theo observing a couple's public display of passion, and her temptation when a stranger makes a pass at her. There was a guy at the bar early and tried to hit on me half of me, wanted him to just for some excitement. Passion. The magnetic appeal of the stranger here might remind us of Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick's meditation on the surprising connection between the erotic and the anonymous. In that movie, an upper-middle-class husband and wife who appear like the perfect couple both harbor secret fantasies of sleeping with other people. In Striking Vipers, though, the ultimate exciting taboo isn't sex with a stranger, but with a friend. Danny and his best friend Carl discover a potent connection, but only when they're outside their own bodies role-playing via virtual reality, other people. It's the best sex of my life. Best of yours, too. So the nuanced insight that comes through in this repetitive emphasis on role-play is that even if one of the problems of modern adult life is that we're constantly pretending, pretending also seems to be the solution to holding on to our passion. Mental note to self. My baby's in the role play. Mysteriously, the episode seems to suggest romantic excitement depends on this sense of escapism and not feeling like ourselves. Another guideline in our twist video is to focus on the people, not the tech. We might get fearful when, like so many Black Mirror characters before them, Danny and Carl stick something in their temples. But the story isn't about this game, it's about the players. The video game is not creating a new need between Danny and Carl. It's an outlet for a connection that was already between them, but they didn't know how to express before. I tried it with real players, other folks, controlling lands, but it, 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 it didn't get me. It didn't get me. 
and me, not like when we're in there, you and me. Brooker has said that the episode is about, quote, male friendship and the issues that men have communicating with each other. Guys suck at talking. And he also said one of his inspirations was the, quote, homoerotic nature of fighting games like Tekken. This is underlined by the phallic name of the video game. Striking vipers. And the way that multiple scenes blur the line between fighting and sexual urges. So the episode gets us thinking about male intimacy and whether men's passion for sports or other violent outlets reveal a desire to connect more deeply than socially accepted behavior allows. Lord, hug each other. <laughs> Guys can be so awkward. On some level, the story is exploring the passion we have for our friends and how they may be the greatest loves of our lives. If we met them in a physical form that we found sexually attractive, these buried feelings might be expressed more dramatically. When Carl comes to Danny's barbecue and says, Oh, wow, handsome. What am I, am I like, infected or something? This line might remind us of our rule to notice the things that seem off or disproportionate. Don't brush them off. Why does Carl use this sharp word, infected? Is there some kind of disease that these men are afraid of catching? There's a fear of expressing their full feeling for each other. Fear that it puts them into a category they're not comfortable with. So, guess that's us gay now. That's a joke. But what's interesting and has a satisfying black mirror complexity about their connection is that it can't be defined by any common label. It might remind us of the series' other most iconic romances, which also involve elements of virtual reality or digital copies of consciousness. Things that make us tempted to say, this isn't real. When in fact, the episode is speaking to the way technology could increasingly become the most effective outlet for our realist emotions and sensations. Striking Vipers raises the question of whether the two men are discovering homosexuality. Nope. Not a damn thing. Not me neither. Or whether it's just about the virtual reality game. I try f***ing the computer control characters. It's bullshit. Shut up. It's like a rubber doll. But in typical Black Mirror fashion, the episode veers away from simple binary answers and gives us a more complicated explanation. Brooker himself said, quote, is it a homosexual relationship? In some ways it is, and in other ways it absolutely isn't. How does it feel? I mean, like, feel? Being the woman's body. The episode channels Black Mirror at its best through the payoff. At Danny and Theo's anniversary dinner, Theo describes commitment as a sacrifice. It's part of being in a partnership. You shut the door on all that shit. You shut it out because you have committed. This suggests that Danny is going to have to give up either A, his video game romance, or B, his marriage. But in the end, there's an option C. He and Theo give each other a free pass to pencil in time for the passion that makes them feel alive. I want that back in the morning. And the sun gives. This ending is a surprising third path, just as the episode's layered, ambiguous answer about whether Danny and Carl are in love stays with us more than a straightforward yes or no. And it's spiritually bleak in a fitting Black Mirror way, representing the compromise of being an adult, a conclusion that's very sad, but which also captures something very true about our modern lives. Family life? Shit, I. In Smithereens, once again, the repetitions here are key clues helping us anticipate what's coming. Is that where you work? Where I picked you up? At Smithereen. Do you work in that place? Smithereen. But the biggest rule that leaps to mind is don't trust your main character. Black Mirror protagonists are usually hiding something from us. Here, not trusting is easy because it seems clear from the outset that there's something wrong with Christopher. From his shifty eyes and awkward interactions with passengers, to the fact that he's eager to drive employees of this place called Smithereen and a little too interested in it. And the way he doesn't share in his support group. I just haven't found the right moment yet. At times, Smithereens feels like a Black Mirror spin on Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Like in Taxi Driver, there's a tension because the structure of the episode kind of forces us to identify with this questionable character, but our instincts resist this identification. Still, as in season three's Shut Up and Dance, we're kept in the dark about what exactly is driving our main character until late in the episode. How young were they in the pictures? So in classic Black Mirror fashion, the secrets come from within us or the person we're identifying with. 
In our twist video, we advised you to look out for red herrings that are there to throw you off. Here, the way the episode encourages us to distrust our main character is a red herring. This leads to our first twist, that Chris is not a villain, but a victim. Drunk driver plowed right into him. Two dead, including the drunk. But the next rule that comes to mind is don't trust the first twist. There's more to the story. We start to put the pieces together that, given Chris's insistence on speaking to Billy Bauer, I just want to speak with Billy Bauer on, on the phone. Maybe this guy is the one who violated Chris in some way, but something is still off. It's hard to see how the founder of this tech company is connected to the car accident Chris was apparently the victim of. So the next twist is that, even though the drunk driver was officially at fault, Chris in fact caused the crash because he was looking at his phone. Little notification thing saved. Someone liked the comment that I made about some photo in there. You just glanced at it, you know. That's all the time it took. So it turns out that Billy was in some sense the villain or to blame for doing something to Chris, but not in the big, personal, specific way we expect, only in the small, everyday, universal way that social media victimizes all of us daily. I heard that, that you make these things that way, addictive. So, 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 so that you can't take your eyes off them. By addicting us, clamoring for our attention, to suck up our time with meaningless nothings, to avoid getting distracted by all the red herrings along the way. Chris thinks it's about money, but it's actually about status. As we talked about in our twist video, we have to try to zero in on the thought experiment at the center of the episode. Smithereens gives subtle hints that it's going to be about the destructive power of our social media addiction through its emphasis on the way technology overtakes and mediates the social interactions we see. Christopher is a driver for an Uber-like rideshare app. He sits in a cafe and can't stand the sight of everyone on their phones. He criticizes Jaden for being so wrapped up in his phone that he didn't notice he was being driven out to the middle of nowhere. The sky could turn purple and you wouldn't notice for a month. You didn't look up and look where I got you. Sitting in the back like that. The small yet insidious way that Billy has violated Chris connects to the episode's title, Smithereens, a word meaning fragments or bits, which we most often hear in the expression blown to smithereens. It's significant that the Twitter or Facebook-like company at the center of the story is called smithereen, singular, a word that you don't actually hear in common usage since smithereens is a plural noun. This highlights the thematic interest of this episode. Technology is leaving us fragmented. The story following Chris captures what it feels like for us as individuals, as we're each isolated, turned into one lonely smithereen something that should only exist in the plural. Watching this episode, we might think of our rule, look at the people, not the tech. Black Mirror usually makes the point that the problems in our technology come from the human beings who design it and use it in ways that reflect our most sinister motivations. Here, that's the case too. It was like some kind of Vegas casino where we sealed off all the doors. They got a department? All they do is tweak it like that on purpose. But this episode has a slightly different takeaway, as it underscores that we can't really blame ourselves for what we do under the influence of our phones. The technology is now so addictive that social media is essentially our society's new substance abuse problem. My, my phone was glued to my head. That was the whole cliche, you know? First thing I saw in the morning, the last thing I saw at night. It's intentional that this episode connects using a phone while driving to drunk driving. And according to the Brain Injury Society, texting while driving is basically equivalent to getting behind the wheel after drinking four beers. This episode is grappling with the question of who's to blame for our tech addiction problem. Every twist invites us to guess who's going to be the villain or victim here. Yet the answer to this blame question is appropriately unsatisfying. There are people at fault, but it's impossible to really hold them responsible, as so many are complicit. In Smithereen CEO Billy Bauer, Brooker carefully avoided the easy caricature of the tech founder as a shallow bad guy. There's gotta be something that I can do, even if it's something small. Although he did say the idea of Billy being on a silent retreat came from the story that Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey did exactly that. Overall, Billy is portrayed as a sympathetic figure who's out of his depth and can't rein in the monster of his own making. I, mean, I got there by degrees. You know, they said, Bill, you gotta keep optimizing. You know, you gotta keep people engaged. So it was more like a crack pipe. At one point, Billy compares himself to God. Tippy, really the only good thing about my position is every once in a while I get to invoke God mode. But this God has no real control anymore. I started it. 
there's nothing I can do to f***ing stop it. Reminding us that there is no savior who can rescue us from this situation. We're too far gone in our addiction. The other important rule to keep in mind for smithereens is to ask, where's the humanity? Black Mirror usually warns us to be wary of our tech-driven world and start valuing each other more. But Smithereens tells us it may be too late for human empathy to make much of a difference. Christopher adored his fiance, but his addiction to his phone made him her inadvertent killer. I killed her over <laughs> dog phone. Billy's attempt to relate to Christopher is futile. Out. Hey, shut up. No way. Shut up. Um, I don't give a f what you do now. Beat yourself up or run a victory lap. I don't care. Jaden leans into his humanity when he chooses to stay in the car and try to talk Christopher out of committing suicide. Don't kill yourself. Huh? But this ends in shots fired at the car, implying that probably Christopher, or possibly both men, don't survive. And the ending montage shows people getting a notification about what happened as we hear the song Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. You're just too good to be true. Brooker said that this scene was about how, quote, this massive drama, this most important day in several people's lives, was reduced to ephemeral confetti that just passes us by. So in other words, this really important event is just another smithereen vying for attention along with the latest cute photo of a dog, which forces us to wonder how much of our humanity have we already lost when this profound human suffering no longer touches us. Smithereens is the rare Black Mirror episode set in a world that feels pretty much like our present day, with today's, or near future, technology. Thus, this episode is a warning. Maybe our world has now passed a tipping point and become Black Mirror. Our technology usage has already gotten to a place of being seriously creepy. We are living in this cautionary tale. And this scary future the show has been depicting for five seasons is fast becoming our present. Nobody wants to hear them. Their daughter is dead because I'm a Notice what seems off in each episode? Don't brush it off, as this is a hint the show is giving us. In Rachel, Jack, and Ashley 2, we immediately get a strange feeling from Ashley's aunt, Catherine. Hey, Ashley, everything okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You taking your meds? You could rush to explain away Catherine's dismissing Ashley's true artistic persona. She's Ashley O, not Leonard f***ing Cohen. As no more than the expected cynicism of the savvy businesswoman. But the off feeling we pick up on is revealed to be more than justified. I powdered your pill stash and put it in your food. This reveal is the first twist. But we should know that more twists are coming. The Ashley 2 doll tells the girls that it needs their help gathering evidence against Catherine, only to pull the plug on Ashley instead. And in the final twist, Ashley wakes up after all. So this episode lives up to the Black Mirror promise of multiple turns to the story. The key rule for this episode is don't buy into the social hierarchy. Question the values. See the animal in a cage you built. Pitch shift? Increase the positivity. Here, we're meant to focus on the values of our culture of fandom. Brooker has said he was inspired by star Miley Cyrus's real-life experience doing a cameo with an act aimed at an older demographic. He said, quote, She went on stage and looked out into this massive auditorium and no one was filming it on a phone. They're all looking at her. She hadn't seen that for about 10 years. It was just like a sea of human faces and that affected her quite a bit. So this reminds us that fans often aren't really seeing this person they claim to love so much. I'm a huge fan. The story here has a number of eerie parallels to the Free Britney movement. The Ashley 2 doll and the giant hologram at the end are two fake versions of Ashley that people get to connect with, never knowing the real Ashley. Ashley, go to sleep. Ashley, go to sleep. And we too may be using our favorite performers, demanding that they fit our image of them just as the limiter on the Ashley 2 doll ensures that fans interact only with the fake, sunny persona the star uses in press conferences. Limiter? Yeah, like, like a firewall. It only let me use 4% of my brain. In recent years, we've seen the hologram trend take off with late artists like Tupac Shakur and Whitney Houston. Photorealistic and fully controllable, right down to instant costume changes. Brooker has said, quote, it's notable that a lot of these people who are being regurgitated by the industry as holograms are people who met very tragic circumstances, and you feel that the industry possibly hasn't looked after them correctly. The episode suggests that audiences want someone who doesn't show any messy complexity or genuine emotion, essentially an artist who isn't really human. Never exhausted, never sick, 
always pitch perfect, bringing her A game. Even at the end of the episode, when Ashley is finally free to perform the kind of music she wants to, it's in a smaller venue. So Catherine was right that this kind of honest material isn't as appealing to a mainstream audience. Other day I walk in, she is writing some obtuse bullshit 20 people are gonna relate to and no one is gonna buy. The two sisters are also mirrors of the two sides of Ashley. Jack is the dark, angry internal self who's in pain and likes alternative music. Pixies, Sonic Youth, Idols, Savages. Rachel is the sweet, people-pleasing self that aligns with Ashley's public persona. Oh my god, I'm such a huge fan. Rachel, Jack, and Ashley are all motherless young women. You know how old I was when your parents died? 22 years old. The episode shows how when a parent is absent... It's on Wednesday. What is? Her birthday. The art and celebrities we idolize can take a central role in raising us. Yet there's an interesting critique here of our culture's assumption that positivity and wholesome empowerment messages are good for young people. Believe in yourself. You can do anything. Oh, come on, man. Catherine trained me to say that kind of shit in interviews. Rachel eats up the empty, sugar-coated platitudes that Ashley too feeds her. If you believe in yourself, you can do anything. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. But the doll's simplistic advice, applied to a harsh high school environment, just leads Rachel to embarrass herself and feel cut off from actual other students. Hi, I'm Ashley too. I'm your only friend. For both sisters, and for Ashley, what really helps them is communicating with their dark feelings. <laughs> Finding outlets to express what's raw and real. Even if this isn't what most of the consuming audience wants to hear, this is the true human value that the arts can offer. So the message here fits very much with the Black Mirror rule that we should always ask, where's the humanity? In the end of this episode, humanity is restored, and while the ticket sales are down, these teens have learned to process and work through their pain. While the setup of Rachel, Jack, and Ashley 2 is very Black Mirror, there's not a big payoff that offers a surprising answer to the question at hand. It's pretty clear to see who the villain is and where the message is going. And the episode's sunny, unambiguous conclusion lacks the dread, creepiness, and uncertainty that tends to be present, at least subtly, even in installments with happy endings. Taking all this together, we'd say Rachel, Jack, and Ashley 2 is the least Black Mirror of season 5's episodes. And our selection for the most Black Mirror episode is, drumroll please, Smithereens. Episode 2 not only puts into practice the most of our Black Mirror rules and embodies the Black Mirror tone in characteristic ways, but it also lives up to the show's promise in a new way by revealing that no futuristic sci-fi embellishments are needed to make our present day look like a dystopia. In Smithereens, the mirror isn't black anymore. It's just a mirror. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. The through line in all three episodes is addiction or obsession. Everywhere you look, people are hooked on the things. It's like, it's like chain smoking. We don't have to completely cut it off. What about like the first Sunday of each month? No. Just now and then. Carl, it has to stop. It was an intervention. That thing was poison. And the undercurrent of that obsession is loneliness, as underlined by the song in the trailer for season five, Lonely Feelings. Lonely feelings. Family life. It's boring. Lonely feelings. Notably, all of these episodes feel like they're in worlds pretty similar to our times. So there's a message coming through that already our current emphasis on tech-enabled communication is making people feel horribly disconnected and alone. Ultimately, while it's important to channel that classic Black Mirror magic, this series is at its best when it also tries new things to surprise us, to question our assumptions, and to remind us to look before we leap. In this season, the central thought experiment did that by asking the scariest question of all. What if we are already in Black Mirror? Finally, an act that will make the live audience put down their damn phones. Hey guys, this is Grace. And today I wanna to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies, Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. 
So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline. And there are no ads ever. Right now on Mubi, you can check out War Witch, part of their collaboration with the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. This Academy Award nominated film tells the story of a child soldier who discovers a magical ability to see ghosts. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.